got a question. Ask Tom on Home Show Radio. This is Home Show Radio live on Facebook and YouTube. Your questions, Tom's answers. Now here's Tom Tynan and Charlie Mosier. And of course, we begin with Ask Tom Live. Soon Tom will be here to answer your questions about home improvements and different things like that. I'm looking around here. Oh, there's the camera. Yes. <laughs> here I am. Ask Tom is now here. Tom is here. And of course, most people listen to me and know me from the weekend where I'm the weekend warrior for going on 35 years now on Sports Radio 610 at Home Show Radio, Saturdays 9 to noon and Sundays, of course, 8 to 11. It's just like another walk in the park for me. It's not, it's not bad. You lock me in a room all by myself, unfiltered with a microphone. Ha, what could be better? <laughs> it works. Anyway, we're here to answer your questions too because we have a website that's free. That's homeshowradio.com. And I say we... It's because I'm going to bring in the other half of Tom. I'm the T and he's the M. Here's Charlie Mosier. See that? Put it, Charlie Put it Mosier together and you have a trademark. Tom That's right. What? We're trademarked. Yes. We're trademarked. TM. Trademark. TM. That's right. There it is. So, right. hello. Or Transcendental Meditation. Hello. We could be doing a little bit of both in home we improvements could. anyway. Yeah. So anyway, That's so thank true. you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. We, yes. we, are, we are here My live. Thing. <laughs> it, yeah, Kate, well, it's important you can hear us. because For a half Thomas hour, Cor I'm sitting here ready to go, and now this thing decides to come out of my ear. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Yes. Yeah. Tom is down in his uh, luxurious condo in Brownsville, and I'm here at the uh, broadcast yes. headquarters of a Home Show Radio over here on the uh, Tony West side of Houston. And you, of course, are wherever you are, and we're happy you are, and you're welcome to join us with questions you have about home improvements and um, any projects you're doing around the house, maybe, um, you know, and, that, and next week we'll have Danny will be here from uh, Home Show Garden yeah, Pros. Yeah, we didn't mention Danny, who does yeah. Garden Pros, Home Show Garden Pros on Saturdays from 7 until 9. That's, That's right, before right. I go on the air on Saturday. So yeah, he's kind he of the warm up, up act. The crowd and he's very good. He's yeah, very good. He's a yes, whole yes, different topic, That's too. Right. <laughs> so his audience That's true. is different. That's true. So, yeah, and, and he will be doing that. So whatever your, your thoughts and concerns are around your house, Tom, I know that... Uh, uh, you on your way, your flight down there had some fun because of the weather yesterday. Oh, Texas um, has always got great weather. Yes, it's a forty-minute flight that took about eight and a half hours. <laughs> but I did um, get to see the the out the window of the airplane, San Antonio, and then of course Laredo. Got to visit the bathroom. Very clean, very, very nice, nice bathrooms good, in Laredo Airport. And then all we had to fly all the way over Mexico. Apparently, they're not shooting down American aircraft, which is good because I was good. in one. That's good. And then landed in 70 mile an hour gusts at the International South Padre Island Brownsville Airport, which is wow. about three rooms and another very clean bathroom, which I visited before I got in my car and drove home. Roughly the size of a three car garage. I understand. <laughs> yeah, the, we're um... it's my favorite room in the house. <laughs> you betcha. Well, Tom, and, and and we, you know, I don't know, we had an experience around here while you were trying to do that. I'm glad they took the time and went around the storm and didn't try a Buddy Holly landing. Because yeah, that, this was going to be bad. Yes. It was going to is a bad storm. It was bad here. You know, we had well, people were uh, praying in the airplane and screaming. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good. No, 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 no. Go ahead. What, I was good. What happened I was there, good Charlie? Till, that was I was good. Till I saw the till I saw the pilot doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No. In fact, you know, we had here in the Houston area, we had hail and there were tornado touchdowns reported, yeah. and it was it was pretty ugly. It, it just reminds you the way the weather can change, and this leads us almost seamlessly into a new segment we're going to do by the way if you have questions time to tee them up go ahead and put them in the comment section down underneath the window whether you're on facebook or youtube um feel free to put them in there we'll we'll see they'll appear in a little window here and we can put them up and answer your questions we also have some questions from homeshowradio.com from the ask tom section and uh, we'll get to those as well but it brings us to a brand new segment here on uh, ask tom live what's news um what i'm going to be doing here every week tom is getting some we, there's a lot of information that goes out every week in the news about home improvements and some of it's legit some of it's not so tom has no idea what's in this segment until he sees it on the show because we want to get his reaction to this live and unfiltered and this week you know speaking of weather you know the the 2021 forecast is out tom and it's calling for 19 named storms this year um, with eight major hurricanes or four major hurricanes and eight hurricanes. So 
we'll see how that pans out. And what makes this interesting and newsworthy was I saw a story in the Washington Post earlier this week where um, there are a number of companies that design and build what they're calling hurricane-proof houses. Okay. What say you, Tom? Is there such a thing? Well, I don't, I don't know anything about it. You can build a structure to hold up to a hurricane. That's okay. not the point. Only a fool will ride one out because you just don't know if you're going to be in that exact moment where it doesn't matter what you do and where you are. The structure might not fall. You might blow away like the cows and the tornadoes and, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland or whatever. But <laughs> I don't think I got that right. Anyway, it it's fine to build a, a structure that won't fail mm -hmm. and you can do it. You can build structures that'll hold up to bomb shelters and things. But the practicality of it is number one. Number two is there's no such thing as proof, but structure resistance up to certain mile an hour winds, mm -hmm. storm surges, things of that nature. But if you're still, this is what bothers me about it. And I lived in from Miami to Houston. I've always been in Hurricane Alley. Uh, in fact, my first hurricane, I was four years old in New Hampshire. When we were stationed up there in Pease Air Force Base, I was just a baby. But the fact of the matter is, is your structure can hold up. And if you want to pay the money for it, it's easy to do. It's not difficult. But the fact of the matter is that you still should never ride one out. You should always go to safe ground. That's just the nature of it because you'll be without power. You'll be without water. You'll, you'll have death and destruction all around you. Uh, it's more than just your little cocoon that you live in. It's your whole environment that sometimes mm -hmm. you just need to escape. And well, I always encourage they, they people talk, that, but yeah. you can design that. And to your point in designing it, is that these builders in the story said, Tom, that they're, they're using plywood, obviously, instead of OSB, like you you've recommended. Sure, yeah. sure. And special metal connectors, which I assume are just better straps than... Are, are, are typically used. Well, they're, um, they're required on coastal counties. Right. All the strapping and everything is required here mm -hmm. in, in, in the Houston area, Galveston right. County. It's all required for the windstorm insurance uh, coverage. Mm -hmm. So those things have been standard for a long mm -hmm. time. And it all comes down to the engineering and the, the amount of wind you want it to, uh, to uh, withstand. Mm -hmm. But the one thing it won't withstand because it'll undercut the ground is the storm surge. Right. That's when the water comes in and just washes away the ground. It's interesting when you're on you a say beachfront, that. For instance, right. okay, uh, your your house will just wash away. It might float like the Titanic <laughs> and then go under, but it will still wash without a foundation. You can't hold it in place. The storm surge is the most deadly thing. It's really not the winds. But it's, and as I said, it's interesting you say that because one of the things they talked about was how high up they're building the house and how they're strapping them to the pilings yep. and all that. But they say that the roof is the most common failure point of the house. Um, so they're they're taking for special for wind, right? And for and wind. how it, how it avoids. But the trick, according to this Washington Post story, Tom, was that they're saying the shape of the house is the thing that deflects the the weather more than anything else, and. I yeah. guess like you like you say so often, it's a question of how they'll stand the test of time. And I got three examples for you here of where um, where these houses were built. Um, here's one of them that the one on the left, obviously, <laughs> was built. And this one survived Hurricane Harvey. And you can see that around it, many of the other ones are blown away. And here's one that survived. I know Hurricane. that house from Harvey. Yeah, this one. Yeah, I remember Harvey. That was that's on Bolivar, isn't it? I I have no idea where it is because they didn't give. I think geography that's the one on Bo Bolivar was leveled, and, and there was this one house. But let me tell you, it was not livable after the fact. No, the people couldn't go back in. They had to, but the structure really held. yes. How is it? Yes. How is it that it wasn't livable? There was no water. There was no electricity, and the and the water got all up. It went so high. It destroyed the underside of it. The ground was destroyed. The roads were destroyed. It just stood out there. All by itself for a long time. I don't know if they finally rehabbed it or not, but it's not like they rode it out and had a party afterwards. Believe <laughs> yeah. me, they had to leave. Right. Well, this one here survived Hurricane Michael, which was a Category 5. These were all Category 5 storms that these survived. And I see, you know, they lost a little bit off the roof. But I got one more yeah. for you that really surprised me. When Dorian went through um, the Bahamas, yes. this one made it through. And, and to your point... You know, it the structure survived, but I'll bet it was a long time before they had services back in there again. Oh, yeah. Um, to become to live livable is different. 
But you know, Charlie, it's easier to survive and build for an island than it is for a coastal area that goes in. Explain inland. why. Because the water has somewhere always to go. Even a storm surge will go over the island and go down the other side. It doesn't keep building up and building up and building up because there's no release on the other side. So islands like Key West and areas like that, much easier to survive. They have homes that have survived in Key West for over a hundred years. Uh, it's amazing how islands are so much less susceptible to, now not just winds, winds are winds, but the hurricane damage and the real stuff is that surge and I'm gonna stick with that. Uh, most of the deaths that come from hurricanes though come from inland. You know, we do that uh, severe weather uh, sh show a couple of times and we've had a lot of people on that we've interviewed and the head of the, uh, the hurricane center was one of our interviewees and mm -hmm. his name escapes me and I apologize, yeah, too, nice yeah. guy. But he said most deaths happen where they're not prepared. On the coast, people are somewhat prepared and they leave. But when you get inland and the storms keep the floods and everything keep happening and happening, that's where most deaths from hurricane, they happen inland more so than right on the coast. Property damage is bad, but uh, it happens inland as far as the deaths go. Sure. Well, the, here's the, it, but here's the catch with these hurricane, yes. let's just call them hurricane resistant or hurricane hardened homes. How Maybe do that's, want to? They're wind yeah. resistant. It's designed for wind. Right, because that's why they rounded the corners and stuff so it wouldn't yeah. create the vacuum behind the house mm -hmm. that a square house would create. They said, let's say, they said the price to build one of these houses runs 200 to $325 a square foot. Now, this article was written a couple weeks, month or so ago. I wonder how much okay. it is now with the escalating <laughs> cost of building material. But it's a, I bet it's a whole bunch more than that. Yeah, and I think I've read some stuff and a lot of people don't know my background, but I went to the University of Miami. I'm licensed in Dade County. I'm a general contractor certified in the state of Florida. Uh, wind design has, I'm, I'm licensed to build multi-story buildings in Hurricane Alley, whether it's Key Largo, Miami, wherever the case may be. But uh, it, it's just a lot of people think that just building this strong bunker is a smart thing to do in a lot of cases it can be even more expensive to re to refurbish them and bring them back than it is to just build from scratch and let the whole thing go as long as you're not in it. Hmm. Well, for the record, okay, so they're calling for 19 storms this year. Um, we heard this in the Texas State Guard on drill last weekend. We oh, did they really? The stats. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, here's here. Dig this. To compare that to last year, last year we had a total of 30 storms in 2020 it was so active. Yeah. yeah it's very active so h how does that compare to this year yeah we'll see so you never know they love to predict don't you know, they <laughs> like, like like we said in our training last week it can be four storms it can be one storm where does it hit is all that matters mm -hmm. and if it's in your front yard you don't care if there's 30 or if there's one and that's kind of what Harvey did. It hit as a hurricane came back around and just rained on Houston for about a week and a half. And everybody, you know, we had whales going down the street, as you've seen on the memes, as they call it, on mm -hmm. Facebook. I mean, it was, that's where that meme came from, was Hurricane mm. Harvey. Well, we had tigers running in our neighborhood. <laughs> you know what? Week. We were warned because my, my, we bivouacked right next to that park where the tiger supposedly mm -hmm. was loose, but he was a pussycat. Yeah, I told everybody, right, don't worry it was in about Fleet, him. It was in Fleetwood, right across the, the, the bayou from where <laughs> yes. we live. It was like fantastic. And you know what? Tiger would never cross the bayou. <laughs> Sandy, Sandy was where he said, Tiger will never cross the bayou. Don't worry about it. We're good. <laughs> well, that's not true. So, They'll get in water. But yeah, as no far kidding. as that goes, just for the, for the Tiger's point of view, uh, he was a baby raised by people. He had no idea how to kill and eat anything. He has been fed hamburgers, Whataburgers, and uh, in Texas, of course, and steaks and everything else. All you had to do was feed him, and he probably would have cuddled right up next to you. He didn't know and any better. He was brought you know up where they, as a pet. You know where they turned him over? Some One of the refugees. Some, a refugee well, that's somewhere. where he is now, but the, the, the turn-in of him when they got him was over at yeah. Westside Tennis Club, where they got... <laughs> I'm sure he got out of that truck and said, ooh, giraffe, yum. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, does, does, to your point, probably not because he's been so <laughs> fed in captivity. But he was—he anyway. was a pet. Yeah. In case but you anyway, don't know, 
I'm in case you don't know what we're talking about, was yeah, here in really. Houston. <laughs> here in Houston, there was a story that uh, they they got they got they apprehended some guy, and he had a tiger living in his house. And the tiger got they came back, and it, it, it took the tiger, ran away. Then they caught the tiger, and the guy with the tiger turned it in. And was, actually, his wife turned it in. Yeah, because she had enough of his her husband's antics. And they said, we'll find a nice home for it. And now it's, it's gone to a very nice sure. home. I, I forgot where it was. Well, to me, the, the thing that upset me most about it is those kind of stories usually start a man in Florida. And uh, <laughs> it does sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. All right. So you want to get your questions in? I want to, first of all, get a little uh, roll call to go here. Hi to Nancy and Chris and Darla, Kathleen, Robert, Richard. John. Hi, John. Good to have you with us. And uh, George, all with us here. Thank you for being uh, along with us on the broadcast today. If you have questions and you want some of Tom's help, you know what to do. Just put it in the comment section. It'll come up and we'll be able to give you questions live. In the meantime, here is um, a question. And actually, Gypsy Mohawk just wrote in about pigmented shellac. And we're going to be answering your question, actually. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it's in this broadcast or in one of our ask tom videos let me ask you just ask you straight up tom he says he, he sent it in a few days ago um his question was about and i'm gonna help me if i get this wrong okay because obviously you're watching but but he said uh he's doing a deck he wants to know what pigmented shellac you recommend he wants to put it on his deck i guess to keep things from coming through so if, if uh, hoping that's close enough to what the question is is there a pigmented shellac in particular that you recommend tom? Okay, first off, if you're going to use a pigmented shellac as opposed to a shellac, I want to make that real clear. A shellac is more clear. It's a little yellowy, but it's like a clear finish. And it was used many years ago on floors and things. You don't use that much anymore. It actually is made from a bug. I do believe the shellac beetle comes from Australia. Uh, that's really trivia nobody cares about. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that pigmented means it's going to have a pigment of some kind, and they're usually white. So when you put it down, it's going to be like white primer paint is what it's going to be. And white primer paint uh, is going to show. So on the deck, if you're going to use it to hide rusty nails coming through, water stains, uh, oil stains that are in, the, in there, you can use it for that. But you're going to have to paint it with a solid color paint, not a stain of any kind, because it'll show a different type of discoloration where the pigmented shellac was. But yeah, you can use it to, to hide any stains. It works great. Uh, if it's rusty, a rust you're trying to hide like rusty nails, Rusty metal primer is probably a better one to use, but the mm -hmm. pigmental shellac will actually work pretty well with that too. The reason a lot of he, painters he don't wants carry to know, it Tom, use it, just can yeah. I just interject here a minute? Um, yeah. He wants to know if they make a clear one. Do you need a clear one? Well, first off, pigmented shellac would never be clear because it's got a pigment. Well, Can you buy you a clear shellac, but it's not real clear. It's like I say, it's going to be a little yellowish. Uh, but I would not shellac a deck on the outside of the house. I would use it for stain hiding stains only. There are so many better products to use on your deck on the outside that you want to have a clear finish. Uh, so I would tell you to go to a paint store and talk to them about the exact look you're looking for. But you can buy shellac with no pigment. It's, I guess, unpigmented or non-pigmented. But it's just going to say shellac. It won't say anything but. But that was something that hasn't been used for a long time. And a lot of places aren't going to carry it. Give you a shellacking. That's right. Out of that bug. <laughs> Squished up bugs. Now, here's the reason. Real quick, since we're on the yeah, shellac, yeah. people say, well, why don't painters use it? Why don't you keep people, people keep it in their garage? It mm -hmm. has a very short shelf life because it's an organic material made from bugs. And the cleanup is not mineral spirits. It's not water. It's actually ammonia and water. So a lot of the painters don't carry those things for cleaning it up. So usually brushes they have to throw away and they don't do the cleanup properly. It has a short shelf life. So you only buy the, what you need. You don't let it sit around for 10 years. And that's why a lot of painters don't use it. They try to use other products. Mm -hmm. Okay, by the way, he had one other question about it. Um, is there a product that you'd recommend for waterproofing? Because I think he probably had it in his mind it was gonna help with waterproofing. There's a lot of clear waterproofers out there. You can go to any of the paint stores. They'll have a line of stains, a little bit of pigment, like a little gray or a little cedar or, or something like that. Usually the better ones have just a little bit in there, but you could go to something as simple as even a, a clear Thompson's water seal uh, for a deck. Now for decks, because you walk on them now, those, those are wax based and they'll wear out after a while and you have to keep to, you have to reapply them once in a while. But there's some that are pretty good out there 
A clear wood finish is a good one. Uh, Woolman used to make a, a, made a lot mm. of products and they made some good ones too. So they're out there and you're not gonna find them at the box stores. You're gonna mm -hmm. find the products that move regular. Go to a paint store. Sherwin-Williams will have their own line. I know Pittsburgh has the Olympic line of stains. They'll have some that'll be clear finishes. And I'll take you this one step further for other things if you're doing on a wall like outdoor murals or things of that nature. You can use a clear acrylic, but it's not a good walking surface, so I wouldn't use it on a deck. But clear acrylics that clean up with water, they work really well on certain applications for different types of things outside if you're looking for a clear finish. Fair enough. All right. Yeah, it's interesting. We have a, um, a wood staircase on the side of the uh, broadcast center here. Yes, you did. And, and, Don't say uh, anything. What? They didn't watch you build it. No, no, I got permission. No, we we did it on that. We did it totally <laughs> legit. I would never. I oh, would I thought maybe you had the priest come out and did. This. I would never <laughs> cheat. I would never cheat. Never in a million years. No, no, that no. That looked very good. No, we got we got legit permission to build it. But the but the I know, point is that right trifection built. But the point is it's wood. You know, we we yeah. we got a material. Uh, we we did our deck at home with Trex. So we don't have these issues, but at the house. But here, you know, we went with the wood, and I'm wondering, Tom, if after the case, because it's starting to age and all that, do I want to go put something on that to maybe preserve the wood a little longer, or is it, it, it no no point at this time? No, no, it's not necessarily true. I mean, you could have Rudy come out and do an oxalic oxalic acid wash on it these big it's get easy me. to say and do <laughs> <laughs> yes. and he could clean it up and take that kind of greening gray stuff going away mm -hmm. and he could put a finish on there if you wanted him to and you'd have to do it regularly you'll see people do it with their fences sometimes but eventually they get tired of it and they finally let it go like it's going to naturally age or, or, or weather i should say all these things outside will do is weather so if you want it to look good then you'd have to do that it's not going to rot. It's just going to weather. And so eventually, 20, 30 years from now, yeah, maybe it would have to be replaced. But that's going to be up to you. But it'll be a regular maintenance. And if you want to, talk mm -hmm. to Rudy. Rudy will do it. You had a beautiful looking staircase that Trifection built. I remember it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a beautiful case. Let's get some of the questions we have from the Ask Tom box, if you will. Um, Jeff and Irving says, due to a shortage, our builder won't be installing radiant barrier decking in a house we're putting up. He says, what are good alternatives we can use instead? We're planning on R49 in flat ceilings. Would attic fans help? How about R8 AC ducts instead of R6? Our builder will install one roof vent per 600 feet of slab area. Is that the same as ridge vents? If not, what are they? What's your recommendation? That's a lot. What do you say? Well, first off, if you're going into the R49s, a radiant barrier is not going to do you a whole bunch of good. So it's kind of, it would be a waste. I mean, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see less R value and more radiant barrier. I think overall you'd get a better result. But as far as that goes, that's so much that uh, I would just leave it at that. If you can't do the radiant barrier, you can't get it, and you got to get your house built, then you're going to have to compromise some. R8 is always recommended today with the new energy standards, and they've been recommended in using R8. We've been using them... I'd have to say 20 plus years now. So the R6 duct work is, is okay for manufactured homes and, and things of this nature, but they're usually not used in a primary home. And if you're going to all these other R49s and all this other stuff I'm sure you're doing in your house, go with the R8 duct work. It's just going to not necessarily make it more efficient, but it's, it's gonna last longer and it's gonna you know, make the air conditioner work a little easier. To, I guess mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. So it's, it's a very little expense to go up to that. Now the roof venting is different. What we need to do is take uh, the square footage of floor space you have in your attic. Then we have to figure out uh, how many uh, square feet of venting you need for soffit and for ridge, in other words, intake and exhaust. So for every 150 square feet of attic floor, then what you need is a, a one square foot of opening. And out of that one square foot of opening, 40% should be exhaust, 60% should be intake because your intake doesn't work all the time depending on the positive and negative air pressures. So that's what you're looking at. I don't know what the net free area of each vent is. And if it doesn't have something to feed it, and that means soffit vents where air can go in so air can go out, then it's pretty much useless. It doesn't do much at all. 
Uh, so it's just going to be there for show more than anything. So with ventilation, you have to have intake, you have to have exhaust. Ridge vents, soffit vents are always the best way to go because it becomes evenly done. If you just stick one vent in a roof and you have all this roof past it, it's not going to vent that area. It's just going to vent a little bit right there. And so it becomes kind of worthless. I don't care how big it is. So what you're looking at is a little bit different formula that I explained. And of course, try to get evenness, which the ridge vents and soffit vents have. And don't block your soffits off on the inside. Put baffles in there so the air can transfer over the insulation and up to the ridge vent. All right. Got to give him some good advice there. M Thank Shirley you. is in on Alaska. Tom over by Lake Livingston built their house in on 2016. Alaska. On Alaska. Yes. What did I say? <laughs> no, that's it. You said did I, I say on Alaska? Word. It's not yeah. like Alaska. It's on Alaska. <laughs> on Alaska. It's not at Alaska. It's not around Alaska. It's on people, Alaska. People who don't live in Texas would never know. Is it Alaska? No, it's on Alaska. <laughs> right. I'm thinking, you know, this is just proof that the settlers here had a sense of humor, that they used Alaska <laughs> yes. in a name. All right. Anyway, well, we so have sure. Mars, Texas. Yes. Well, that's true. And, 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 and what is what else? Egypt and Moscow. Paris. And Paris. Yeah, Palestine. Palestine. All right. So we live in Lake Livingston. Okay. <laughs> And built our house oh, in 2016 one. and have stained concrete floors. The stain and finish has really worn off in the last several years. Lots of moisture in the house, 60 to 75% in warm weather. Could the floors be a contributing factor to this, Tom? No. The answer is just, this is a simple one, no. Uh, the, the stain does wear out. And after a while, you have to rethink of floor coverings because it's hard to, to uh, strip them all and restain it. it it just because it gets it soaks into the concrete so you have to think of it as a one-time beautiful floor and then all of a sudden one day you say hey let's go to texas floors and look at some vinyl tiles <laughs> and things like this it's just the nature of it put a lot of them in it was a fad that went around for a long time but it has nothing to do with whatever humidity problems you're having in the house always first look at the air conditioning system Get those checkups every year. Make sure they do static air pressure tests. Make sure they look at the delta T, the, the drop across the coil of how cold it gets. It should be around 25, 26 degrees. That's going to be the key to dehumidification. The floor has nothing to do with it. And if you like the way it still looks, that's fine. But it has nothing to do with humidity. That's a load off our mind, I'm sure. Can't wait to go over to Texas yeah. floors. I know, I know. It's on Alaska. <laughs> it's on Alaska. And it's a short hop across the lake. And then, you know, so. Lake all right. Livingston, yeah. I don't know what's And Lake there. Livingston, the somewhat movable feast of a lake, too. So you're never quite sure where that bad boy is going to land. All right. Steve in Richmond has another one for us. He says, I installed some outdoor wall lighting on a very uneven stone surface. Can I use backer rod to fill the gaps before I caulk? Is there any code restrictions with doing this? with electrical equipment no there really isn't in fact it's a good idea at least across the top not to let the water seep in where you have your wire connections your screws that hold the light to the wall uh, probably onto the electrical box if it was done right so you have a metal electrical box in that in that stone that's the way it is so if you want to use a backer rod and for those of you that don't know what it is it's like a foam it's used a lot in uh, expansion joints in driveways where they fill it with the backer rod so you have it all filled up and then they lay a little bit of uh, modified urethane over the top of it and just make a little bead so you don't have those ruts that the old wood and stuff might have rotted out in or you see it a lot in commercial concrete application but backer rod if you wanted to shove some in there and do a really nice sweet caulk joint but be careful with the caulking because it can look horrible if you don't do it nice it's perfectly fine. No code issues, no conductivity issues. Keep the water out of there, yes. Yes, water and electric, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> if Tom didn't mention yeah. it already, it's a bad combination. I think so. Yes, this is my contribution to home improvements here today. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Hey, I'm here, I'm here to help. All right, see, 30 years sitting next to you, I'm figuring this stuff out one step at a time. And let me tell you about Charlie Mosier. Oh, no. With Charlie, safety is job one. There. That was a good one. I didn't beat Antoinette you up. Antoinette from Oak Forest, <laughs> yes. Illinois, writes, every Illinois, day, every day out of the blue, um, when none of my appliances or faucets are on, I get this loud pop sound from my west side of my house, 
where the wall, where the freezer is located. But even without the ice maker running, she gets this noise. It's so loud that it sounds like someone threw a metal ball outside at the west wall. It seems to happen more in the evening and sometimes in the day. What causes this? Do you have a guess, Tom? I have a guess, and, and it's, I, th I think I know what it is, but I can't tell you why. So it's going to be a partial answer, no doubt. But I have the same thing. I have a cooler in my radio studio in Houston. And every once in a while, I hear this pop. And it just, I, it takes me back, but it's the little refrigerator, for some reason, makes this noise once in a while. And I have a feeling your freezer is doing the same thing. I'm sure it has something to do with the refrigerant. Uh, I don't know how, I'm, I don't know a lot about appliances. I'm a house guy, but I think it's just the freezer. I don't think it's an issue. I think you notice at times when it's probably more quiet than when it's real noisy uh, with the kids or whatever you have your life going on. And so if you're sitting in the evening, just being nice and quiet, watching a movie or reading a book, and all of a sudden you hear it when it might've been doing it during the day and you didn't notice it. But I don't think it's an issue. I think it's your freezer. There's a load off your mind. Now, I want everybody tonight to go sleep next to their refrigerators and freezers and see if you hear a pop. That's where the dogs and sleep in do, our house. <laughs> they like the warmth. You know that. They do. Underneath the refrigerator and freezer, it rejects the heat. And dogs love to sleep around it. And that's why if you ever get a coil cleaning brush under a refrigerator or freezer where you have dogs... And you stick it under there and pull it out. It looks like you pulled out a big rat of hair because all that hair goes under there. But they love that warm breeze, I guess you might call it, underneath there. Goes double if you have a husky. So I'm just <laughs> yeah, saying. that would be really bad. Yeah, our husky yes. is uh, mass massive <laughs> shedding. And my Maltese will sleep with the lab at night, but the husky during the day. So kind of a question back and forth on that, right? All right. Hey, our buddy, our Jimmy John has got one for you. Just wrote into us. Quick Hello, question. Uh, how yep. do I know if my AC has a hard start capacitor? I want to use my portable generator on my house and have about a 50 amp inlet on the outside, but was told I need a hard start kit for my AC. Can you tell, Tom, by looking at it if it has one? I, I guess on different units you can. I can't tell you how to dig in there and look, and I don't want to take you down that road because those components all look the same. But if you have someone that's worked on your AC, if you get your AC checkup done, if you personally have owned that house from the beginning and never had one installed, the chances are you don't. Uh, so most units do not come with them. So I can give you some, uh, some guidance on this. They don't come with them. Uh, they're usually put on after the fact, usually on older units that are giving people trouble and you wanna nurse it along another four, five, six years, a hard start kit will help uh, have the motor just uh, start up a little easier. But for the most part, most units don't have those at all unless you actually pay, paid someone to put one on. Mm -hmm. He wants to know if, if newer units might have them. No, no. And it's funny because they make the units last longer. They make the units a better quality. They make it start up easier and less electricity starting up. You got all these wonderful things, right? And I've been in meetings with air conditioning technicians and contractors where they get together and talk about these things. And they always will go to the manufacturers and say, why don't you just put them in? Why do we have to go back and install them? And what, the, what I have seen, unless somebody changed over the years and I don't know about it, what I always heard was the manufacturer said, if we start doing it, we have to raise the prices of our units. Then we can't compete with the other people that don't do it. Charlie, you've heard right. this probably in every right. business deal in the world, right? Mm -hmm. You just don't add something that the others won't do. Right. And so that's why it never, ever was an addition to a unit and not even offered. It's why you're glad that all the airlines have seatbelts. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if we put them in, everybody's going to know. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, my favorite thing about seatbelts and airlines, I'll just say this since we're on the tangent, is I'm so glad every time I get on, they explain how they operate. Because I'll be darned if I can remember every time I get on there, you put it in and you have to lift. To, is that right? Or you lift it off to put it well, in? Well, you got to talk to the to the legal eagles that run the airlines yeah. behind right. the scene. That's well, what I like is, them. yeah, what I like is they usually do that briefing after everyone is seated and buckled in. So, <laughs> and, and the latest one. But I'll tell you what, yeah. yesterday, I'm yeah. glad everybody had it on in that plane I'll I was bet. in because it was dropping. And I was, I was thrown into the air and that seatbelt kept me in place. So don't sit right. in an airplane and ever think you don't need it. Just put it on. Oh. Even if it's a little loose, please Always. put it on. 
Always. You'll always crack your head right you on bet. the top of that thing where all your luggage is. Yeah, no, no, no. You should always, I mean, you know, as, as yeah. um, oh, who was it that said you're, you're in a chair in the sky and, you know, you're moving 600 miles an hour. You might want to wear a seatbelt. Just saying. Let me tell you, my father was a pilot. They always right. strapped in in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s. When we mm -hmm. had cars, when I was born in 1958 and we had cars, I remember being three, four years old. He had seat belts installed in every new car we ever had and paid extra. And everybody was buckled in his car, no matter what. And I know we weren't flying, but he treated it just like his airplanes. It's interesting you say that. My mother had a similar approach. Everybody in the front seat was wearing a seat belt. But when she needed to shut us up, little punch to the brake. <laughs> so, I've been through and, those two. And yet somehow we survived. All right. Last question for today comes from Dave. Unless you all have one you want to send us. You got a few minutes to still do that here. So David writes to us from, I think it's Livonia, Michigan. He writes, I'm replacing a 25-year-old HVAC system, considering upgrading single-stage furnace from 92% efficiency to a single-stage 96.5%. The old system has efficiency to um, the old system has uh, preset blower speeds. Is there any advantage if I go to a variable speed blower on a single stage system? The new AC unit will be a single stage two ton and the furnace 60 kBTU. Uh, what's your input, Tom? No, I wouldn't modify a brand new system. These are efficiency systems. Uh, but when it comes to variable speeds, two, two speeds, you have different uh, models. Uh, it usually comes as a package together, first off. And secondly, it's not as much as the efficiency as it is the comfort. Sometimes some of these things kick on so strong that you get this hot blast of air and, and you can really feel it. In Houston, we feel it a lot. Up there in Michigan, probably not so much. But it comes on too hot, then it goes off, then it comes on too hot because uh, we have these gas furnaces that heat up and you get a little blast of cold air and then this super hot air. So making it go slowly, it slowly adds the air to the room and makes you more comfortable. But as far as these efficiencies, you're 94, 95, 96%. You're talking just minuscule amounts of, of any kind of savings. The comfort level is only gonna be really what it is unless you're super uncomfortable and have some kind of medical issue where you need something very p particular, then maybe you can go to the other ones. But quite mm -hmm. frankly, just buy a good unit today. Don't spend extra money. You're not going to see it back. And the less bells and whistles on them, like going from a, uh, just a single stage uh, speed unit uh, motor to a variable speed motor, those motor costs can go from 100 to $700. The Shut cost up. to replace a motor because it's a computer. And Charlie, you're the IT guy. Those variable speeds are run off computer boards, and you can't buy the board. Mm -hmm. You have to buy the entire assembly. They don't sell individual parts. You can't work on them. They throw those big motors away and take them down from a scrap metal, just like they do the regular ones that you can buy for 160 bucks. So right. be careful when you get into the fancy motors. And they put them in containers and send them to third world countries where people sit there and get paid to unwrap all the precious metals from them so they can and be reused. And pour all the mercury into their water supply. It's wonderful right. what they do with right. those things. I don't know why yeah, they hate America. Sad. It's weird. So anyway. But, <laughs> <No kidding. laughs> so, anyway. So, so that's what we got here. That's our little program for this week. We appreciate y'all watching. Um, if you'd like to get your questions to us so we can answer them in our daily Ask Tom videos, visit here over Home Show Radio and click on that blue Ask Tom button right there. It'll take you to this page where you can fill out a little form you can send us videos you can send us pictures and we'll answer them as soon as tom and i get done doing this program here we're going to flip the switch and record a bunch of uh, videos because tom likes to answer questions and help people and so we post a new one every day at homeshowradio.com if you're looking in the greater houston metropolitan area and you're looking for people you can trust we recommend strongly this place homeshowradio.com and if we scroll up you'll see down here we have all our pros listed here on the on the uh, on the page and if you click on that button right there where it says find a pro it takes you to this page where you'll find all our pros listed by category ain't we fancy so you can find them all right there and then of course tom will be here on the radio this weekend saturday nine to noon sunday eight to eleven on sports radio 610 or charlie correct me if i'm wrong you can stream it on our website you can spotify it you can do a lot of things but do a lot of you things. can find it 24 hours a day for that matter yep. if you just don't yep. want to wait for the weekend yep. or you're working on the weekend 
I'm going to get hate mail from the people over at the radio station, though, because because it says the radio.com app on there. I keep forgetting I got to update that because for some reason, the brain trust at Intercom decided they wanted to call themselves Odyssey. And so they have a different app. Now. I heard that the other day. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I just I think it was Chad that said it. People who make just, more than us and have more education decided it was a better idea. And so uh, we're going to go along with do. it. Yeah, they have the desk with all the pencils, so we're going to listen to them. But so uh, remember, wait, wait, we're going to we're going to air this in front of everybody. Do I now call it Odyssey or Sports Radio? Oh, it's a Sports Radio six ten, an Odyssey radio okay. station. Fancy, clear, yeah. clear as a bell. That made perfect sense to me too. <laughs> and then, and by it. the way, um, <laughs> while we're thoroughly confusing you before Tom every Saturday and Sunday, remember you can catch the Garden Pros. They're here Please. live. Seven to nine. And my understanding is one of these garden pros has changed places. We're having a new garden pro. And if I had done my show prep, I'd have his name here. Who's going to be joining us from uh, uh, Kingwood Garden Center starting uh, in a couple weeks. Oh, awesome. here. So and so you'll okay. catch him. And that will be it for us for today. Um, catch Tom on the radio. Send us your questions. Appreciate you being here. And we'll return next Thursday um, at um four o'clock central time and we'll have uh danny from the garden pros here to answer gardening questions with us too so thanks for being here thank you for for watching got a question ask tom on home show radio home show radio free advice from a pro who